A pleasant good evening to each and every one. Thank you for being here this evening. We are about to begin to our evening meeting. The Lord has been here with us all day. He has blessed, he has just lifted up, and he has taken us on a journey. And this journey is to draw us all a little closer to him. And so this evening, we are about to just fill this place with his praise. And as we do that, the Lord promised to glorify himself with his presence. And so we want to welcome one and all. Thank you for being here this evening. And may your hearts be lifted up to where the, the, the God of all glory dwells. And as you worship and as you praise him, you yourselves will be lifted up in the presence of the Lord. At this time we're about to begin, let us just stand where we are as we invite his divine presence to continue to be with us. Loving, merciful, kind, and compassionate Heavenly Father, your desire is our salvation. And that's why you came down in the person of your son to die on that cruel cross so you can open the gates of heaven and welcome us in. We thank you, God, for the message of hope, the message of deliverance, the message of salvation. We thank you that there is hope for each one of us. And so as we worship you tonight, we pray that the message that will be shared will be a message to draw us closer to the uplifted and glorified Savior. Bless the proceeding, bless the singing, and God, may we all be lifted up again and again through the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for worship on this holy day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Be seated, please. At this time, we are just so delighted and happy to have our praise team here with us. So at this time, our praise team will take us from here in the worship of our soon coming and uplifted Savior. Our praise team. Amen. Whatever you do, just make sure you sing along with us. Yes. What did I say? Whatever you do, make sure you sing. Even if you don't know the song, just sing. Just sing. Bless the Lord. Hear my cry, O Lord, and tend unto my, my plea. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Yeah. 
I know that you know that Jesus is real, don't you? Uh, we are here because he's real. Our very presence here tells us that. Um, we, are, we are so grateful that uh, our God has blessed us. In, in fact, Paul says he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Everything that you and I need is in Jesus. Uh, we were in for a retreat this morning. God blessed us tremendously as he showered down his Holy Spirit on Pastor Steed as he delivered the message God laid on his heart. Uh, I was blessed uh, as I came in and, and shared in the ending portion of the service. And I know that you who were here from the very beginning experienced God in a new and fresh way. Uh, this afternoon, uh, he's here again. He will be here uh, with us again tomorrow afternoon at 5. We want, on, on the weekend, we want to have it early so you can go back home and settle into the evening's routine and be ready for the work week. And then on uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday, it is at 7. And you can be sure that by 8.15, you will be out on your way, be able to get back home again and do what needs to be done. We certainly appreciate our music ministry and the fine work that is being done by our praise teams and our our music ministry uh, this afternoon is a combined uh, eclectic group and we are so grateful uh, for that uh, as we go through the week uh, we're going to have uh, a, a singing team that will be with us uh, Sunday Tuesday Wednesday Friday and of course on Sabbath we kind of split it up with our regular praise team and uh, our, our guest musicians so we have, God has something great in store for all of us. So let's, let's avail ourselves of it and enjoy the blessing that comes. Uh, we're grateful for Pastor Steed. Uh, I've known him since he was yay high. Uh, that doesn't mean that I'm that old, but, uh, you know, he was just yay high. Uh, a little kid running around the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, that's a way back in, in, in the years. Uh, his, uh, his parents were strong leaders in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Bermuda. Uh, he grew up, uh, went all the way through Adventist education, Bermuda Institute, a beautiful place, our K-12 through school there on the island of Bermuda. Uh, after finishing there, he went on to Oakwood and graduated from theology and uh, the conference, of course, uh, sponsored him to the seminary. He came out of the seminary, started his ministry in the Southern New England Conference. You see, because I was no longer in the Bermuda Conference, he couldn't start in Bermuda Conference. So, uh, but because I, at that point I was in Southern New England, so he came and he started a ministry in Southern New England Conference and did an outstanding job there. And you know when you're good, every eye, all eyes are on you everywhere. And so the folks in Central, South Central Conference saw him online and said, we want that guy. And so he was interviewed by the president of South Central Conference over the phone, gave him, gave him a job, and before you know it, he was in the South Central Conference. Pastor Steve, you, 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 you pastored the last pastorate in South Central was in Memphis, Tennessee, right? In Memphis. Uh, so he's a, he's a southern guy. Uh, after he got done in, in, in there, uh, he went on to the Bermuda Conference where he pastored the city church for just a little over six years, and he currently pastors the Southampton Church in the beautiful island of Bermuda. Uh, we, he is married to Rochelle. They have two wonderful children, a, a daughter and a son, or is it a son and a daughter? But it, whichever way it goes, it, uh, two, two, two children, wonderful kids, uh, a son and a daughter daughter and uh, we're grateful that he has uh, taken the time out of his busy pastoral uh, responsibilities to be with us for these next two weeks uh, next Sabbath evening we're going to uh, lean on you a little bit we're going to serve lunch we're going to serve lunch on next Sabbath, so send, put the word out. Uh, we're going to come back right after lunch, do the Bible class, and then we're going to go straight into the service because he has us on a speaking appointment with the Atlantic Union uh, at 6, right, Pastor? Or 6.30, whatever, but uh, early. So he's going to be preaching next Sabbath uh, three sermons. 
uh, one in the morning, one here in the afternoon, and then another one for the Atlantic Union. Uh, and so that's what happens when you have uh, someone who loves the Lord, loves preaching, and loves people. And so, uh, we're, Pastor Steed, we're glad that you're here. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you for coming. And uh, now we're going to have our praise team lead us in our, in our theme song. So we're going to invite you to stand. We're going to sing the theme song. And right after that, Pastor Steed will come and share the message that God has laid on his heart. Church, say amen. amen. Uh, can the I heard an echo. I hear a lot of echo. Uh, can the church say amen? amen. No, we're not doing that. Can the church say amen? <laughs> Praise God. Uh, before I pray, I intentionally want to hold this praise team up for just for about 10 seconds, uh, Dr. Boja and the musicians, because uh, the praise team here at Belvedere, um, you, you, don't, you don't see any uh, Philistine paraphernalia. Lord Jesus, I wish I had a witness in this place. Um, you should understand here in the United States that that's a rare commodity. Can the church say amen? amen. Uh, they're becoming the minority. And I think they should 
be applauded for having the courage, uh, and this church having the courage, to stand uh, with the standards of our church. Can the church say amen? amen. I, I just want to say amen to them. It's a joy. You never know what you're going to find these days, and it's a joy uh, to see them here. Uh, before I pray also, uh, we should not, you know, he, he always skips over things, but, but uh, uh, at the time I got sent to the seminary, uh, Dr. Bojan was the president. He's the one that sent me to the seminary. Can the church say amen? amen. He, always, he always tries to cover these things up. Um, but I want to say to you that I, I thoroughly enjoyed this morning. I'm already starting uh, to just enjoy this kind of restful time. In addition to all my responsibilities there, I also serve as the youth director for Bermuda Conference. And it's constant. It's nonstop. So I'm thankful for this getaway <laughs> where I can just preach, uh, rest, and um, had the wonderful ladies of this church, you know, even when they tried to serve me other things today, okay? The wonderful ladies in the church uh, heard my cry during the sermon <laughs> and brought me some good fish on the side. Can the church say amen? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, <laughs> let's, let's pray together. Spirit of the living God, we beg that you bless this word right now. In Jesus' name, let everyone say amen, amen. amen. You got to do me a favor. I'm going to ask Heather if she would come back up here. Just play a little something while I read the scripture. See how she has on her sneakers. She's rushing off, you know. <laughs> no, I'm thankful. Uh, Heather was playing when I was here nine years ago. I lift up verse 13 and 14. Verse 13 and 14 of the 17th chapter of an Old Testament book we refer to as First Kings. First Kings chapter 17 and verse 13 and 14. The Bible says, And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, <laughs> and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. Oh, Lord, help us. I've entitled this eschatological, this inexorable, this moribund pericope, sustained till the rain comes, sustained till the rain comes. Thank you, Heather. Can the church say amen for Heather? Here's where I want to go with this word tonight. To get the immediate context of this text, Elder, we have to go back, if you would, to a day when Elijah marched into the palace with holy boldness. When you read the story from Ellen White, she says, for some strange reason, 
they just didn't stop him on the way in. He marches right up through all, past all the guards, marches right into, if you would, the actual throne room of, of King Ahab, walks up to him and tells him for the next few years, there will be no rain. It's an amazing thing, if you would, because uh, it's one thing to say something, it's another thing for it actually to come true. And he walks out, and everybody's just stunned. He walks out, and in that moment, the rain stopped. Now, if I could pause parenthetically for just a second, I come from a country where, in essence, uh, if it's no rain, it's a beautiful day. Oh, I wish I had a witness in this place. But I want to let you know, if you would, for three plus years, there were beautiful days. <laughs> but they were sorrowful days. It was glorious outside, but in, yet it actually got so bad that parents were watching their children die in the streets and couldn't do anything about it. Elijah, if you would, comes out of the palace, and it's very interesting to me because he's commanded to go hang out down there by Jordan, by the Jordan River, uh, if you would, in a brook called Cherith. I need you to understand this because if you would, he has to go and hide out because Baal worship was dominating the Israelites at this time. How could this be after God had done so much for them? Well, one of the big problems with the nation of Israel was actually its king in King Ahab. King Ahab was a very weak man who had a very strong wife named Jezebel. Uh, yeah, yeah. At, 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 at their house, Jezebel was in charge. Uh, I wish I had a win. Jezebel ran the house. Lord, Lord help us. Jezebel was in charge of the house. Uh, it's all right. It's all right. I'm, I'm going to help somebody out here today. I, I need you to understand that God, from the very beginning, has designed that the male should be the head of the home. It's okay. It's all right. I ain't afraid of y'all. Uh, listen, listen. God has designed from the beginning that the male should be the head of the home. Okay, I'm going to say it one more time. It's, it's what we're working on it. God has designed that the male should be the head of the home. Amen. You see, I'm very, I'm very nervous out here because I see some men that are looking at their wives trying to get permission as to whether or not they can say amen today. But I, I need you to understand that in essence, if you would, God designed for the man to be the head of the home. Now, I'm going to help you out, ladies. Men, I need you to understand that this comes with an incredible responsibility to be a servant leader. Oh, I wish I had a witness in this place. In other words, if you uh, make sure that the trash is taken out, Lord help us, that you actually help the kids with their homework, if you actually help wash the dishes, oh, Lord help us, when, when she doesn't feel like cooking, you go in there and cook. Oh, uh, yeah, it gets a little dicey now, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, or if you can cook, you at least call Papa John's or somebody to deliver something. I I'm trying to help somebody in here today that in essence, you actually call her throughout the day to check on her. Lord help us. You give her flowers for no reason, not a birthday or nothing else. Um, you tell her every day you love her. You tell her she looks beautiful even when she's having a bad hair day. <laughs> oh, Lord help us. Uh, I, I need you to understand that one of the problems that we have is that in essence, if you would, uh, the men have not been doing their job and then they get upset when the women don't want to do theirs. Oh, Lord, help us. Uh, if you just spend time with her all day, you will find uh, that when you get home, she'll be willing to do whatever you want. You can get what you want because you won't put in the time to do what you should. Yeah, it's all right. It's all right. Um, I, I, I need you to grasp that concept today because you need to be a servant leader and not a run over. 
Oh, Lord Jesus, man. Uh, uh, Ahab is a weak king and a weak man. His wife, Jezebel, comes from a, a town that Baal is dominant. Baal worship is, if you would, running the whole place, uh, if you would. And she brings that to the nation of Israel as his wife and imposes that on the nation of Israel. She had tons of prophets, and the way she would seduce them, if you would, is that she constantly had these massive feasts where only the prophets that supported her were allowed to come. The other prophets were kept out of work and were actually starved. Many of them could not find any food to eat on a daily basis. It was rough for God's prophets under Jezebel, and there was nothing anyone could do because Ahab answered to Jezebel. Oh, I need somebody here to understand today. Your household should never get to a place where the man is answering to the wife. It should also never get to a place where the man is dictating to the wife. I need you to understand uh, it should be a constant struggle to outlove each other. <laughs> you know what she loves, and you know what he loves. Stop acting like you don't know. Now, they always say, well, what comes first, Pastor, the chicken or the egg? Uh, you know what I'm saying? Who's supposed to do the loving first? Because, you know, you have these standoffs in marriages. Well, he ain't do nothing for me. I ain't doing nothing for him. And he's like, she ain't doing nothing for me. I ain't doing nothing for her. And there's a standoff. Well, I'm sorry, but God places that responsibility on the husband. The Bible says, husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church. That means the romantic responsibility in the marriage begins with the husband. You're supposed to be the one that sets the table. You're supposed to be the one that lights the candles. Oh, I wish I, you're supposed to be the one that puts the veggie wine on ice. You're supposed to be the one that puts the flowers on the bed. You're supposed to be the one that actually, lay, why? Because understand what Jesus actually did in loving the church was lay his life down for the church. You need to understand she'll be willing to do anything you want to do when you just do your responsibility of loving her first. It's all right. It's all right. I'm trying to help somebody. You know, there's some couples here that are sitting a little distance apart. I'm trying to help them out here tonight uh, so they can have a good night. You know, I want them to have a good night tonight. Here's the thing. I, I, I want you to understand uh, that there's a serious problem that's going on because understand God expects the man to lead even though most times, not all, but most times, he's not the most spiritual in the house. Jesus, man. Oftentimes, the wife is more spiritual because she is built to depend on a man. A man is not built to depend on another man, as it takes him a while to accept and, if you would, submit himself to a man, which is Jesus Christ. It's not his natural tendency to do that. And so oftentimes the wife is the one who re reads the Bible every day, studies the Sabbath school lesson, has prayer. Even when he ain't acting right, she still has her own devotions. You know, this, this often happens. But the male is not placed there. The male is not placed there because he's the most spiritual. He's placed there because God can't trust him to do anything else. Man. That in essence, left to his own, he wouldn't spend any time doing anything constructive. He wouldn't spend any time with God. So God makes him the head of the house so that in essence he has to constantly tend and serve his family so that he doesn't get into trouble because he's too busy taking care of the family God has provided for him. It's all right. Ahab has allowed Jezebel to not just take over the house, but take over the kingdom. Here's the amazing thing, because if you would, right after he leaves the palace, God sends Elijah to the brook Cherith. 
It's a beautiful thing, right? He said, don't worry. Go there. You can drink the water from the brook. And I'll send you ravens with bread and meat to feed you. It's easy for us to skip over that part of the text. It's easy for us to, if you would, just kind of run over it. But God chose black ravens to feed Elijah. Black ravens came to feed Elijah. Hold on, hold on. Black, heathen, unclean ravens. Hold, 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 hold on a second. Ravens eat any and everything. Yes. They are unclean birds. I'm trying to help somebody here. Yeah. I'm trying to help somebody. You can't tell God how to send your deliverance. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Sometimes he can't find nobody in the church to do right by you, and he has to go on the outside to bring about your deliverance. Don't tell God how to deliver you. He brings unclean birds that for three plus years turn into, I don't know, kosher meat and eating, uh, clean meat. And they're not touching the trash for three and a half years because they've been commissioned by God uh, to feed his prophet. Go pick up some bread and some meat and deliver it to the prophet. Twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening, the birds come flying in. And Elijah, uh, the mouths are clean enough where Elijah can take the food out of their mouths and put it in his own and eat it. Uh, I've had, if you would, experiences with these creatures. Lord help us. I remember in Boston playing golf on the golf course had a golf fellowship. We went to play. We were at Farm Neck. We were over there on Martha's Vineyard. And I'll forget, they said, watch out for the raven, watch out for... And that, this is what happened. They can't make this stuff up. They said, they will come and steal your food. They'll do it to you every time. And I was like, really? Uh, so, at one point, I went and got a sandwich. Middle of the, middle of the round, I went and got a sandwich. It was, uh, it was, it was a tuna fish sandwich with, I guess you could say, veganish tendencies. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But it was, it was a tuna fish sandwich. And here's what happens. Here's what happens. I went to go on the green to putt. When I came back to the cart, my sandwich, which was wrapped in clear plastic, uh, a clear plastic covering, was gone. I looked around. The raven was flying off with my sandwich. And uh, I didn't believe in wasting money, so I chased after the raven. <laughs> I, I chased after the raven. And the raven, I don't know, I don't know he couldn't handle it or if he was afraid, but he dropped my sandwich. He dropped it. And Doc, you know, being a good Christian, I went and picked that sandwich up. And... I cut around where the raven ate, <laughs> took that part out, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I ate the rest because, you know, we can't be wasteful. We must always be good stewards, you know what I'm saying? We must always be good stewards. But it's an amazing thing because, in essence, they snatch up anything. Yet God uses them to feed his prophet. You got to understand, man, Elijah's on the run. Elijah is getting searched for. It got so bad that Jezebel was making Ahab go from city to city, town to town, tracking down Elijah. Here's why. Here's why. The people were starting to believe 
that because there was no rain, because understand, when the rain goes, they all go to the Baal prophets, they all go to the Baal idols, they all go to the groves and the high places, and they're constantly praying to Baal for rain. And no rain is coming. The people started saying, you know what? Baal must be dead. Jezebel wants to fix the story because everybody's saying Baal must be dead. He's no longer a god because we're praying and we don't have any rain. And here's what happens. Here's what happens. Jezebel changes the narrative, gives them a paradigm shift, and Jezebel sends out the message that no, it's not because Baal is dead. It's because Baal is very angry because we haven't found Elijah. At this moment, everybody is searching high and low to find Elijah. They're literally going town to town, and they are threatening the leadership of every single city that if they don't turn in Elijah, they will wipe them out. It's an amazing moment because, if you would, Elijah is still sitting in the brook. He's still being fed and taken care of. And in this moment, uh, everybody is on the hunt for him, and they can't find him. You know, it's interesting, uh, all these different people trying to find one man, and they can't find him. I need you to understand we're coming upon a time uh, when we will be the hunted. Uh, there's coming a day, a time of trouble that we've never seen before, when we will be hunted. They will come searching for us. And with all of the technology that's out there today, how can we hide? How can they not find us? Well, listen, at a certain time, I'm sure they will. But they can't find us until God says so. How do I know? You say, preacher, how do you know they can't find you? Well, there's a text in Psalm 91 that says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High God shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. Understand, can't no GPS see through the feathers of God? Oh, I wish had a witness in this place, man, that in essence, uh, in essence, they can't find you until he says so. It's an amazing moment, if you would, because at a certain time in his experience with Elijah and this brook, the Bible says one day, because there was no rain, the brook dried up. What happens to you? when the brook dries up. I want to let you know that when the brook dries up in your life, it's not because God is no longer providing for you, but rather sometimes he moves his provisions to other places because he no longer wants you to be where you are. Understand, he promises to sustain you and take care of you throughout your entire experience. But you've got to come to a place where you trust him even when it's time to move. Sometimes, if you would, God shuts doors. Not the devil. Sometimes God shuts doors in your life so you can let go of something and grab on to something else. Listen, I'm, I'm going to help you. Sometimes uh, God causes you to have your car repossessed. Not the devil, God. Sometimes he causes you to lose your house. It's okay. I, I'm not afraid of you. Understand this. Lose the house. Lose. Why? Because number one, you got a bad deal when you got the car. And you got a bad deal when you got the house. And you can't even afford the payments. Every, every month, you're having to choose between those payments and your tithes and offerings. It's okay. And so in essence, he will allow you to lose it so he can give you something better that you can afford. <laughs> because he would rather you come to church and go to bed at night with peace of mind than some fancy car or fancy house you can't afford. Oh, Lord, help us. So understand, if he shuts the door, 
Walk out of the door, if you will, and say, I'll bless the Lord at all times. You want to take it? Take it. Because if you're providing for me, I know that what you have for me is far better than what I have right now. Hold on a second. There's some other people that need help in there. Some of you have a really messed up boyfriend or a really messed up girlfriend. Uh, understand, when they leave you, stop crying and whimpering and fussing the whole nine yards. Uh, because if they left and God let them leave, understand, it's simply because he has a right husband who will wait till he says, I do, before he does. Oh, Lord, help us. Uh, I, 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 I need you to grasp this concept that in essence, uh, some of you young people, if you would, uh, have relationships that you should not be in, uh, that God's trying to get you out of. Uh, understand, he's trying to protect you from a lifetime of misery. Uh, he's trying to keep you from, if you would, ending up with one, two, three, four kids and no daddy there to provide and make sure that you're all right. Uh, understand, uh, he will shut doors uh, so that he can open better ones so that you can be prosperous in this life. Yeah. Sit around here whimpering and whining every time a door is shut. God is in control. <laughs> Give it to him um, and let him handle your problems. It's an amazing thing if you would because when this door is shut, God tells him that I've prepared and already spoke to a woman in Zarephath. Uh, I, I didn't know before preparing this sermon that in essence Zarephath is the very town that Jezebel grew up. And here's the thing. The thing is, is that you got all these Israelites that are worshiping the Baal God. They're supposed to be God's true people, but they're all worshiping a heathen God. While in Zarephath, where all they do is Baal worship, God has converted this woman, <laughs> where now she's serving God in a heathen land. Lord help us. <laughs> I, I need you to understand, just grasp this concept just for a second, that God loves everybody. God loves all the people in Belvedere, and he loves all the people that are driving by Belvedere. <laughs> Lord, 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 God, listen, some of the nicest people you will find do not come to church. It's okay. It's okay. I, I, don't, I don't care. L listen, listen. Some of the nicest people you will find are not in church. It's okay. I'm not afraid. Yeah. Because, understand, God will use them because they have a very simple faith where they trust God even though they haven't made it inside of Belvedere yet. They trust him. I, I, I know this firsthand. I do a lot of Bible studies. I, I baptize a lot of people. Understand, uh, every now and then, Doc, the Lord reminds me that he doesn't need me. He'll send me a person and as I'm going through the Bible studies, they're like, oh, oh yeah, Pastor, I'm, I hear you saying this, but I got to be honest with you, for some weird reason, man, I, I just started keeping the Sabbath. I just, I just read it in the Bible one time. I thought it was a good idea, so I started doing it. <laughs> then you get, oh, you, oh, well, Pastor, you know, truth is, man, you know, I've lost my taste for pork and, 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 for, and for chitlins and for shrimp and for lobster. I, I just lost my taste for it. I just, you know, don't desire it anymore. Uh, uh, well, Pastor, you know, truth is, I, I kicked uh, my girl I was staying with. I already kicked out the house. Man. I just said, I, I don't want to do this. I want to wait till I'm married. And, and after a while, you realize that the Holy Spirit has already convicted them of everything that you're trying to teach them. And in that moment, you realize that he could have saved them all by himself. Scripture lets you know that God doesn't need us. He doesn't. You find even in the Bible, if you would, the disciples were out there and they were fishing all night. All night. And they caught nothing. Jesus comes down there by the boat and says, cast your net on the other side. And when they threw it over there, Ellen says that the fish we're jumping up to meet the net. Hold on 
on a second now. How did that conversation go in the water? See, when he said, cast your net on the other side, what the fish translated that to mean is, it's time for us to get in position. <laughs> They go to the other side of the boat and they're gathered there. Can you hear the chief fish now letting everybody know? Hey, listen, listen, I need everybody to understand that this is a suicide mission. That everybody that jumps up will die. Understand though, as soon as you see the net, just get to jumping. Why? Why? Because our master has given us a command and even if it means we have to die doing it, we're going to jump anyhow. And when the net is cast, they jump jump. And that night, they were nothing but a bunch of fish sandwiches because they were determined to serve God even to the death. And you've got to get to a place in your life where when God tells you to get moving, you get moving knowing sometimes that you might not make it through. Knowing if you would, but the Bible says, be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. It's crazy how animals and creatures obey God without any back talk. Whenever he tells us to do something, we got something to say. Many of us are guilty of giving God unrequested assistance. God does not need your help in your salvation. If you were any good at it, you'd already be saved. God needs you to get out the way. Don't even be a passenger seat driver. Don't even get in the back seat and be a back seat driver. Take your carcass and go sit in the trunk and let Jesus drive you to heaven's home. You cannot save yourself. The only way you get in is if Jesus is in control. It's an amazing thing because if you would, God converts a woman in a heathen place without a Bible worker. Oh, I wish I had a witness. Uh, without any help, she's converted and she's determined. But her faith is starting to wane because Elijah shows up. And when Elijah shows up, he's told this woman will be there. He gets there. And he asked the woman for some water. Can I just get a little bit of water? And she starts moving to get the water. The water's one thing, okay? The food's a different story. Because after that, he says, you know what? While you're over there, bake me a little cake. Bring me a little cake over here. The woman looked at him. Let me read the text. The text says, she said, sir, let me tell you something. I'm about to gather two sticks. She had the nerve to count them. Just two. Right? I got a little bit of flour in the barrel, and I got a little bit of oil in this cruise. I'm about to make my last cake, and me and my son are going to eat it and die. Elijah says, it's, it's real fun, Elijah says, okay, that's cool, but do me a favor, before you do that, <laughs> before you do that, uh, come on, what, what does it say? Before you do that, take care of the man of God. <laughs> uh, Elijah said to her, fear not, go and do as thou hast said. Now, it's, it's real weird, his language is really weird. In verse 13, she says, we're going to eat it and die. Elijah says, it's okay, fear not. Go and do as thou hast said, but make me, therefore, a little cake first. Oh, I, I got a problem with you making a cake for you and your son. Make me a cake first, right? And bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. Hold on. Hold on. Elijah's acting as if he didn't just hear what she just said. <laughs> she just said, all I got enough for is one cake. I'm going to make this one cake. Me and my son are going to eat it and we will die. He says, I hear what you're saying. Go and do what you're going to do. Do what you just said you're going to do. But first make me a cake 
that afterwards make you and your son a cake. Oh, Lord, help us. Some of you missed it. That in essence, um, oftentimes, um, when you start talking with no faith, God will speak faith into your life. He will tell you you're about to do things um, when you don't even think you have the strength to do the little that's going on right now. Oh, come on now. He will tell you to return a faithful tithes and offerings when you can't even pay your electric bill. Oh, that's okay. And he says to you, go ahead and return the tithes and offerings, and then go pay your electric bill. Oh, I wish I had a witness in this place. Oh, man, I, I need you to grasp this concept, because in essence, he totally ignores what she has to say and tells her, go ahead, do what you're going to do, make me a cake first. But then he says this, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel. <laughs> The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail. Let me pause here parenthetically. Notice he did not say that the barrel would stay full. He didn't say that the cruise of oil would stay full. What he said was is that they will not run empty. Uh, hold on a second. I need you guys to stop fussing to God when the cupboards run low. He has kept you all of this time. Huh? How dare you fuss to him about what he might not do? Oh, Lord, help us. He's provided for you every step of the way. Why would you give up on him now uh, when he's carried you all this time? Uh, it's an amazing thing because he does not promise that, in essence, the flower barrel will stay full, just simply that it won't run out. Why? Because God has a way of are providing for your daily needs, uh, and he always provides it right on time. Uh, oh, I would love to see the angels uh, that were responsible for just putting a little more flour in there every night, uh, putting a little more oil in there every single day. Uh, why? Because uh, you have to get to a place where you trust God uh, even when you cannot see uh, where your provisions are coming from. Uh, all you know is that he will show up. How he will show up, you don't know. But you got to get to that place because the time of trouble is coming and you're going to have to learn to trust God even when you cannot trace his hand. Oh, friends, it's an amazing moment here because he just says to him, every time you go back at night to make your cake, you'll have some bread and some oil. But he doesn't stop there. He says, you will have this until the rain comes. <sighs> oh, I wish, I wish, I wish somebody got this. You will have it <laughs> till the rain comes. It's okay. I'm going to help you in just a second. The text says, you will have what you need. <laughs> until the rain comes. Okay, I'll help you out right now. We are told that in the final day, it's going to rain. Oh, I wish I had a witness place. The promise from Scripture is that it's going to rain. Now we're told it won't be water, but fire next time, but it's going to rain. <laughs> the text is letting you know emphatically that God will sustain you and provide for you until the rain comes. <sighs> what are you saying, preacher? Well, we're about to go through a time of trouble that the world has never seen before. And the promise from Scripture is that you will be sustained, Lord help us, until the rain comes. I, I, I've heard uh, that our bread and our water uh, shall be sure. You know, we, we, we need to really learn to get along with each other because 
The only thing you're going to need in the time of trouble is a cup and a knife. Oh, I wish I had a witness. Actually, you know what? We don't even need knives. We don't need knives. We can break bread together. The truth of the matter is, all you're going to need is a cup to catch some water uh, when the angel should understand uh, that our bread and our water is going to be sure until the rain comes. That's the promise that God has given to us. That's the promise that he's drawn to us in Scripture. I will provide for you until the rain comes. What does that mean? That means that right now, as you walk this journey together, you've got to learn to look out for your fellow brother and sister in Christ. It's one thing to return a faithful tithes and offerings. It's another thing to give up your last to somebody in need. Some of you don't know this, but you have a fiduciary responsibility as a Christian to always bless somebody who's less fortunate than you. Even when you don't have, you're supposed to give what you don't have to those who have less. Uh, <laughs> it's the only way you can actually become, Ellen says, partakers of the divine nature of Christ. It's when you give when it hurts. Oh, Lord. Uh, that when others are in need, you give when it hurts. When you don't have it, you say, you know what? They got less than me. Let me bless them. And in that moment, you have taken on the nature of Christ, who when he climbed Calvary's cross, you got to understand he left everything, gave up the majesty of heaven, came down here, and if you would, how do you do that? How do you do that? Go from a place where they're worshiping you and adoring you, and they got a crown on your head, and they're everybody is adoring you, and you come down here to be broke down here. Lying in a, come on, in a, in a manger, a place where they feed cattle. I've been there. The place where he was born is whack. Coming down here, if you would, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger because there was no room for the master in the inn. Grew up poor. Doesn't have much of anything down here. Working hard to make ends meet. Doing all of that for you. And the most interesting thing is that he gives up his body. They whipped him. They beat him. And I want to let you guys know, I'm not sure, like every time I read these texts, I'm not sure that we're going to like what Jesus looks like. The way they beat the criminals back then, with those whips, it literally ripped all the flesh off of their bodies. It would wrap around their entire bodies, rip the whole flesh up. You could see their organs. You could see their bones. You could see everything. They, they crushed thorns on his head. They thrust a spear in his side. He's scarred. He's got keloid scars all over his body, scars on his face. They punched him. They beat him. They whipped him. He's got holes in his hands, holes in his feet. For most of us, that's not the most attractive person. But oh, I can't wait wait to look upon his face. I can't wait to sing about his amazing grace. I can't wait to sit at the welcome table. I can't wait to be in his presence. Hey, listen, he may not look like what we want when it comes to our beauty standards, but when I think about the goodness of Jesus and all he has done for us, I don't care what he looks like. He's the most beautiful creature I've ever seen because what? Once I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. He showed up and delivered me, and now I'm alive forevermore. In that day, we will celebrate his goodness because here's the thing. When he gets to the cross, 
He had nothing left to give. He had given it all. And when he had nothing else left, he stretched his arms wide and gave himself. And what he's asking us to do today is to show the same love he had for us to others who are in need of a Savior. Jesus says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples by the love you have one for another. Help me out if you would. I want you to turn to your neighbor real quick. Look your neighbor in the eyes and say, neighbor. I'm sorry, say, neighbor. I love you. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, I can't lie. Sometimes you get right on my nerves. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. It's true. It's true. I know it's true. You don't have to shake your head. I know it's true. <laughs> Come on, look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor. Neighbor. By God's grace. By God's grace. I'm going to love you anyhow. <laughs> I'm going to love you anyhow. Now look at me. Look at me. Look at me. The reason we make this commitment to each other is because when we were unlovable, Jesus loved us. The Bible says, Romans 5, verse 8, but God commended his love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I want to let you know that marriage, marriage is one of the greatest tools, marriage and even having children, is one of the greatest tools you learn about the love of God. It's a great tool. Because, no, keep looking straight. Because, because when you got married, you didn't know half the things you know now about your spouse. Yeah. The weird thing about it is the closer you get to somebody, the more they do little things that irritate you. Oh, oh Jesus, man. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You didn't know all this time that they really don't like putting the top on the toothpaste. You didn't, you didn't know. <laughs> you didn't know. <laughs> now they get on your left nerve. They get, they drive you nuts. But God allowed you to find that out in increments along the way. Because he knew, if you knew all of that, when you walked down the aisle, you would have not have said, I do. Nope, 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 nope. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. <laughs> Lord, what's wrong with you? Look at me. Understand. Understand um, that he allowed you to get married and to find out things in increments along the way. But when he married you, when you came to Jesus Christ, he knew everything about you before he got into the relationship, yet he married you anyhow. He said, I do anyhow. He has stuck with you even when you've left him. He has stuck with you anyhow. He keeps looking for you anyhow because of his love. Oh man, uh, the Bible says surely goodness and mercy uh, shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell. Understand, when the Bible talks about surely goodness and mercy shall follow you, it's, it's actually relating to a dog and a dog's tail. It means that in essence, uh, you're the dog and his goodness and mercy are the dog's tail. Uh, and wherever you go, uh, his goodness uh, and his mercy follows you 
every single place you go, whether you're in the club, whether you're drinking, whether you're smoking, whether you're doing nonsense, it doesn't matter. His goodness and his grace keeps chasing after you. There are some of you that are in God's house because God refused to give up on you. How dare you give up on somebody else? When he refused to give up on you when he knew everything about you. So yeah, some of you have been married, some of you been married 30, 40, 50 years and can't believe that you're still finding out new things that you don't like. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm telling you. It's un See, I don't like when the ladies start elbowing the men. I don't really like that. Here's the, here's the thing. It's important to realize that in that moment, you are learning about the love of God who not only knew everything about you, but every time you mess up, he keeps forgiving you and giving you another chance to make it right with him. If he didn't give up on you, then you shouldn't give up on your children. That's bone of your bones and flesh of your flesh. And no matter how messed up they get, they are God's children and they're your children. And God wants you to reach out to them and keep praying for them and keep holding them up so that when he comes in the clouds of glory, don't worry, don't worry. If you have trained them right, the text says, train up a child in the ways you, when he's old, he will not depart from it. Better spoken, it will not depart from him. What you taught him and her or her is their way home. When they go away, that's the path home. When they go away, they'll call and say, you know what? Dad, I think it's time for me to come back to church. Uh, you know, Dad, I'm not living right. Dad, it's not working out for me. Some kids learn the right way and some learn the hard way. Some of you learned the hard way. Some of you ran from Jesus for quite some time. But he kept chasing after you. And now he's challenging us to go chase after those that we say we love. <laughs> so I see, I see this lovely couple over here, got two little kids, you know. She keeps looking at him. I don't know why she keeps looking at him. But here's, a, here's, a, here's the thing, though. Here's what I love, man, is that the kids become these reminders of all the little mess you used to do as a kid. It's a funny thing, Elder. Kids think they can get away with stuff with their own parents. They don't realize yet, everything they're doing, you already did it. <laughs> the reason that they know to do it is because they got it from you. <laughs> yeah. And the same headaches they're causing you is the same headaches you cause your own parents. But your parents loved you anyhow. You're here because of his goodness and his grace. Let's learn to love each other even when we don't like each other. Lord help us. Some of you don't like each other. It's okay. There's some couples in here that don't like each other. It's okay. It's all right. I'm not, I'm not afraid of you. I, I, I understand. You really don't like each other anymore. Why don't he just go somewhere? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's how it is. But you need to understand that none of your relationships are detestable or are as detestable as it was when God had to come and save you. We were the worst of the worst. And he left heaven to save us. So let's learn to love each other, man. Is that all right tonight? Come on, your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. Father in heaven, place this amazing church in your hands. Beg, Father, that you would teach them the love of Jesus Christ, that you will help them to understand that you love them so much 
that even in the midst of their trials and tribulations, you will keep them until the rain comes, so long as they place you first in their life. Give up their best to the master is the command from heaven, and he will bless them tremendously because of their willingness to lay it all on the altar for him. Thank you, Father, for your word tonight. In Jesus' name, let everyone say amen.
Bless you all. Amen. Amen.